Okay, thank you everybody. Let's begin with our next panel. Um, we have three outstanding analysts in the field, and so I hope you'll give them your full attention. Um, we've just heard the National Security Advisor describe how we hope to move ahead in reducing nuclear risk, and I hope he provided some optimistic, some optimism to all of us that the U.S. does not intend to engage in a three-way arms race. But I will ask each of our panelists specifically if they have additional optimism on that point. Um, the topic of this panel is preventing a three-way arms race. For many years, of course, the focus of nuclear arms control has been on the bilateral competition between the United States and the Soviet Union, later Russia, uh, with apparent Chinese intentions to build up its own nuclear arsenal. Uh, are we in a position to avoid that kind of arms race, uh, both in the short term, the medium term, and the longer term. And so to uh, discuss this with us today, we have uh, three great experts, uh, Lynn Rustin with the Nuclear Threat Initiative, uh, John Wolfstall with Global Zero and the Center for a New American Security, and Tong Zhao, who's on the Program on Science and Global Security at Princeton University. You can find their full biographies in your program guide. What I'd like to do is get us started by asking each of them a question, uh, letting them uh, respond as they wish for a few minutes, and possibly a second round of questions, and then we will look for good questions from the audience. Uh, so you feel free to jot down your questions as we go, and when we get there, I'll ask you to raise some hands and I'll pick uh, some people who look like they're ready to ask the most perplexing questions. <laughs> um, so let's start with uh, John. And again, the primary question uh, for each of you is, uh, how do you take what Mr. Sullivan said this morning? Does it increase in any way your confidence that we will be able to avoid a nuclear arms race that will be far more expensive and, in my opinion, much more dangerous than the arms race we engaged in in the 1960s and 70s, uh, is the approach that we've just heard outlined the appropriate one at this stage? Um, well, thank you, Tom, and, and let me say thanks to Daryl and to the Arms Control Association. Um, I always get sentimental when I come here because I uh, came to the annual meeting in 1990 and uh, they announced that they were going to have the first ever position to focus on nonproliferation. I immediately went up to Spurgeon Keeney and told him I wanted to apply and he said, you know, are you cheap? And I said, yes. <laughs> uh, and so I got the job and, uh, and it was the best break I've ever had. So uh, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to come here. Uh, still cheap, uh, but, uh, uh, but I appreciate the chance to come back and give something back. Um, so uh, let me start by saying I'm very sympathetic to the position that Jake and, you know, behind the scenes, Pernay and Kara were in and trying to write a speech um, for the Arms Control Association in what is an extraordinarily difficult period for the United States and for the world generally. Um, they are uh, putting fire after fire out. Um, they have done a remarkable job in holding the NATO alliance together in a unified way uh, and something that hasn't been done in over a generation in response to a generational threat um, due to the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. So, um, you know, I, I will call Pernay this week and tell him that, you know, when I wrote speeches for senior leadership, they were much better received for uh, the arms control <laughs> community than when he wrote them. Um, so, you know, I, I appreciate what he is trying to do, and I appreciate that the, what the president, um, where his heart is and where his interests are in. Um, but I think there's a critical, there are two critical elements missing from my point of view on China. 
I mean, they're trying clearly to get people to calm down. Um, you heard the, the president's off the record remark about the balloon nonsense. And, you know, we saw this town hyperventilate over a balloon um, over Montana. I'm sure they're still scarred over the experience. Um, I mean, we shouldn't take invasions of American airspace lightly, but we are the strongest, richest country in the world, and I think we have to re act in a way that shows that we are confident that matches our capabilities. And I think that should be true on nuclear as well. Um, you know, I, I read a recent report that talked about how we need to accept that China is a near-peer competitor today on nuclear weapons. We have 4,000 nuclear weapons in our arsenal. China maybe has 400, all right? We're still at a 10 to 1 advantage. Are they building up? It looks that way. Do we know why? Not really. And so I just think we have to keep things in context. Um, the other piece that I thought was important and unfortunately I think missing from uh, uh, Advisor Sullivan's speech is it's, it's fine and well to talk about risk reduction and management of these dangers and that's his job and their responsibility and they are difficult jobs. Um, but we still have to have a vision for what it is we're trying to do. Um, what are we seeking in the long run? Uh, when we tell China and Russia we want to engage them on arms control and risk reduction, to what end? And the United States, I still think, does much better, both with our allies and with the rest of the countries in the world who, let's face it, are not rushing to help Ukraine, right? I mean, we're still leading the alliance, but we still have trouble with, call it what you want, the Global South, the former non-allied movement, who basically, well, we don't want to get involved. Um, we still have to have a vision. And the fact that he didn't talk about a world without nuclear weapons, didn't talk about nuclear reductions, right? We still have way too many, more than we need for our security. Um, you know, that we weren't talking about our commitments to uh, general and complete disarmament as has been longstanding policy dating back to the NPT in 1970, I think is a missing element here. And I understand why the political trends in Washington are difficult. Um, he's fighting against people that want to break out of New START and match Russia and China one for one. Um, so, you know, I recognize politically that's difficult, but I still think we have to be strong with our vision. Even if it's going to take a lot of work and a long time to get there, we shouldn't give up on that. Uh, and so I would have been a bit more optimistic if they had broadened the frame just a little bit more. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, let me first note that uh, Lynn Rustin was one of the inspirations for including this panel. You all, of course, read Arms Control Today cover to cover every month and her cover story in March on the three competitor future together with Mark Melamed uh, helps to frame the thinking on this topic. Um, Lynn, the same general question, whether you're more optimistic on the chances of avoiding this three-way race, um, and also how do you think, or do you think, that Russia can be brought back into a bilateral dialogue? Are there on-ramps? Are there, that clearly the U.S. is not going to meet Moscow's conditions, cease support for Ukraine before discussions can begin, but are there other gestures, steps, or in the terminology, on-ramps that the U.S. may be able to take? Um, well, thanks, Tom, for having me here today, and um, I'll note that my co-author, Mark, is somewhere in the audience. I can't see because of the lights, but he's here. Um, so, I, you know, I think what we heard from Jake was basically Oh, well, it was useful to have that speech because there hasn't been a comprehensive statement of the U.S. Um, policy and positions on arms control um, and nuclear policy since the, you know since the uh, nuclear posture review came out and you know developments continue to proceed. So I think it was you know useful for them to lay out their thinking. And basically, what I heard was a work plan for the end of the first Biden term. I mean, it, it didn't. So to get to John's point, it really didn't have a long-term vision. It didn't even, it kind of had a lot of question marks at what happens after 2026, although there was a willingness to, you know, engage in a dialogue with Russia um, if Russia will uh, 
will do so, and I think the administration actually's positions are probably more fully developed in terms of what it would do in a in a negotiation with Russia than than they are with China. Um, I thought it was significant that Jake that said that there would be no preconditions for um, for talk with Russia on nuclear arms control because that hasn't been clear to me in the past at all. I think it's been a debate in the administration. I don't know if this means that's settled or not um, in terms of everything from, you know, the war being over, you can't negotiate with Putin, understandable why people would feel that way, um, or even that Russia needed to come back into full compliance with New START, and it seems that they're saying now that the door is open to a discussion about not only hopefully returning to compliance with New START, but more realistically talking about what comes after New START. Um, I think, so that's, you know, so those are, that partly answers your question of, um, you know, they've just lowered the barrier to entry uh, to a dialogue with Russia. I don't think Russia's ready, um, based on Putin's behavior, including in, under New START, to have that dialogue now. But I just believe, as we stated in our article, that, um, you know, not, it, it will be in Russia's interest to continue to keep the United States constrained in terms of its strategic nuclear forces, and I think that's going to be just as true at the end of this war, if not more so, than it is now. I mean, there's a reason why Russia didn't announce it was exceeding the New START limits, although it's a little bit playing with fire by, you know, by um, deciding to suspend uh, participation and other elements of the treaty. Um, so I, th I think there's just a strategic logic that will get us there, and I can't tell you whether it's going to be, you know, during Biden's first term, after that, um, but we will find ourselves back at the table with Russia. It will be a much harder negotiation because it won't be, it won't be limited just to the systems that are currently um, controlled under a new start, and that's, and that's where the challenge will come in. The United States will continue to want to um, consider all nuclear warheads, including non-strategic, non-deployed. Russia's will, will continue to be interested in capturing the prompt global strike, concerns about missile defense. Um, and then there's, there's the kind of the, the new technologies and challenges that Jake mentioned today that are not um, as um, conducive to including in any kind of formal arms control uh, but still will be kind of part of a mix of things that will need to be discussed. And my, my guess is that some of this will have to be discussed, you know, in parallel at different paces in different channels. But, but the question is, how do we actually get to that point? And I do think the time will come. I don't know if it's when the fighting, the hot war stops um, in Ukraine, but I, I do think it will come because it's in the mutual interests of both countries. Thank you, Lynn. <clears throat> Tong, I'd like to ask you about 11 questions. Uh, I constantly recommend your writings on the Carnegie website to audiences and to individuals who are interested in how Beijing views U.S. moves. Um, I'd be uh, happy to ask you about optimism or pessimism after this speech, if you'd like to say a few words about uh, Beijing's motivations for increasing the uh, nuclear arsenal, uh, about the prospects for Beijing accepting the rather open-ended offer that Mr. Sullivan made, but also how might Beijing uh, interpret his words about the U.S. Uh, retaining strength in every domain nuclear, conventional space, cyberspace, et cetera, how that is likely to be read in China. Uh, I have seven more questions, but I'll let you pick which of those first four you'd like to talk about. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's a, such a privilege to be here. Um, you know, I'm certainly encouraged by um, uh, Mr. Sullivan's um, expressed uh, interest and commitment to engaging with China on arms control, uh, strategic stability. Um, but I still wonder if the U.S. policy community as a whole has a good understanding of Chinese thinking uh, that is driving uh, the Chinese uh, build-up. 
Um, I think we have to look at China's nuclear policy change, which is taking place apparently, looking at the number, the efforts to diversify the forces, the growing interest in posture change, such as a potential shift towards launch under attack posture, the growing interest in developing capabilities to manage nuclear escalation, um, the uh, opacity in China, the persistent opacity, or even increasing opacity about you know, you know, the, the logic, the rationale behind Chinese measures and the end, the end goal of this current campaign uh, of modernization. Um, we have to understand this change of nuclear policy against the, the context of China as a country that is changing. Right? China as a country has changed dramatically in recent years. I don't think the U.S. policy community has, you know, has you know, put enough effort to under that broader context, and then how that affects China's nuclear policy thinking. Um, in this regard, I, I do think we have to understand that both fear and ambition are driving China's nuclear buildup. And in fact, the two things are closely interconnected. The current Chinese political leadership appears to have convinced itself that the U.S. has adopted a much more aggressive and hostile strategic approach and intention towards China. And they don't think this can be resolved through reasoning and persuasion. Um, and they think only by building up and demonstrating a much greater strategic capability, that will change American uh, understanding of the balance of power and make the United States treat China more equally and respectfully. Right? So it's this ambition to increasingly challenge American predominance to you know, erode American influence in Asia Pacific, but also in other parts of the world, that ambition is driven by this perceived necessity to challenge US um, at the capability level uh, because there's no way to, to change American thinking through, through reasoning. So that contributes to the power-centric mindset. So the, the fear and the ambition are two sides of the same coin. But I don't think the U.S. community has understood accurately about the fear part that is actually more important. Um, in this regard, you know, the U.S. debate about whether you need a bigger arsenal um, uh, to deter Russia, China and Russia simultaneously, I think takes the assumption that you have to include the new uh, uh, Chinese nuclear weapons as a point, as additional aim points in your nuclear targeting strategy. But you, you didn't really explain why. And, and that discussion in the United States is uh, fueling the Chinese belief that the U.S. is insisting on a nuclear you know, pr preemptive strike doctrine. That means the U.S. is driven by you know, an intent to maintain nuclear hegemonism um, and you have to you know, explain to China in the way that China can understand. If you say you, you need a damage limitation capability, you need to you know, explain to China why China shouldn't also pursue a damage limitation capability. Right? China is now so confident, so uh, ambitious. Whatever capability policy U.S. thinks necessary for American security interests, China would want to know why China shouldn't pursue similar capabilities. So that's, I think, internal thinking that U.S. needs to, to do. Um, and there's lack of understanding about China's internal decision-making dynamics, the leadership, the policy elites, the general public. They work in an increasingly closed um, environment that uh, generates a very strong internal feedback loop where the more assertive interest of the top leadership encourages the policy elites and general public to amplify the same uh, policy that then appear to the top leadership as if he has a popular mandate to pursue more assertive foreign security policy. And it's under that 
dynamics, we see the military, the uh, rocket force, coming up with slogans like, you know, winning strategic victory with strategic nuclear weapons. That's very new. Uh, but why is it driving that? It's perhaps more about the, the pressure on the military, on the rocket force to appear critically loyal um, to the leadership. It doesn't necessarily mean the rocket force has thought through the implications of that new slogans. But the lessons, I think, for this community here is we shouldn't assume the Chinese uh, nuclear policy is inherently cohesive, uh, uh, coherent, um, because it's responding to a top-level political pressure and we shouldn't assume that the U.S. has a long-term strategic thinking on nuclear weapons. The more uh, recent evidence shows that China is actually taking a step-by-step -step approach, building some nuclear weapons more, then re-evaluate the strategic environment, then make a next decision, which means the U.S. actually has opportunities to exert influence and shape Chinese next decision. Um, so I, I hope we can jointly look more deeply into the Chinese internal dynamics. I, I still think there are opportunities uh, to build a more cooperative uh, nuclear relationship. <clears throat> Thank you. That's fascinating. And more than once, uh, one of your sentences made me think of a mirror image in Washington about motivations and rationale. <clears throat> and that ought to lead to the possibility of a productive conversation, even if it starts at a much lower base than what we have built up with Moscow over the years. Um, John, let me go back to you. Uh, our very good audience gave Mr. Sullivan a, a tough question uh, about politics, and that is the uh, legislation sponsored by Senator Cotton and others to require the U.S. to pull out of New START and that, at least in my opinion, sets uh, conditions that would make any future arms control agreement impossible. Um, how would, I, I mean, I'm interested in how you assess whether that will go somewhere in the Congress, and if it does, perhaps as a piece of the National Defense Authorization Act, how that affects the potential to move forward with either Russia or China. Um, <clears throat> I don't, I got yelled at once by Vice President Biden uh, when I offered him my political opinion. Uh, he said, you may be really smart, but you don't really know that much about politics, so let, let me handle that part. Um, but now that I'm liberated, you know, I can, um, you, you know, I, whether it's a Democratic president or Republican president, there generally is very little desire to see Congress legislate foreign policy and treaty um, uh, moves. So, um, you know, I don't think it has any prospect of going anywhere. Um, and it's one of those things that you could easily, I'll, I know Lynn will nod her head, we would immediately start to draft the statement of administration policy. You know, would we veto a bill if it included limits on the president's uh, authority uh, to conduct foreign policy or, or military policy as commander in chief? Um, I also don't think that Senator Cotton has as much resonance in the, in the Congress as he might have had a few years ago. I think his behavior in response to the Black Lives Matter protest, his interest in calling out the 101st Airborne to quell uh, peaceful dissent in the United States, I think has limited his uh, credibility. But I think it does represent uh, what has been a longstanding traditional view among the extreme conservatives of uh, being opposed to any form of arms control in the United States and any sort of mutual constraint or limiting American policy. You could have easily seen a bill like this come from Jesse Helms uh, as well as from Senator Cotton. So I don't think it has much prospect. But I think it does represent what President Biden and others and we should be worried about, which is this sense um, that uh, if arms control breaks down, um, some will welcome that as a good thing. Um, that the United States should pour more money into its nuclear and defense industry, even though we're approaching a trillion dollar defense budget, um, because there's still this sense that that's how we won the Cold War. We outspent the Soviet Union and crushed them under the wheels of our military might, uh, when in fact it was a deliberate decision uh, 
by sensible people recognizing the danger that nuclear weapons posed to get out of that cycle. They understood that nuclear weapons were unusable. And um, I think the big message in the bill and in the sentiment that's expressed by those who say, well, we should build up to match China and Russia one for one, is the sense somehow that this is a test of our manhood, that we have to show them that we are not going to be second to anyone. Um, presidents generally understand that these weapons are unusable. Um, that, you know, uh, the idea that a nuclear war cannot be won and therefore should never be fought is a reasonable sentiment to most people outside of the nuclear field because they recognize that nuclear weapons are different. So I, I think we'll continue to battle these threads of political thinking that all we need is, you know, a few more nukes here and a few more nukes there, and then the Russians and Chinese will know that we mean business. Um, and I think we would be better off listening to the sort of sentiments that Tong just expressed, which is, you know, uh, we need to understand what our adversaries are thinking and why they're acting the way they're acting. Um, and uh, instead of mirror imaging thinking, if we were in their shoes, how would we behave? And what would be the main things they would want to focus on? Um, and, you know, I think Lynn has put her finger and mark on exactly the right issue, which is if we're going to get serious about arms control and engagement, which requires us to actually talk, right? I mean, that's the American way to sort of handle this. Let's, let's talk it out. We're going to need to get smarter about, and the termino I can use it here because the terminology is okay, asymmetric arms control, right? How do we assess a world where we're prepared to limit certain things in exchange for Russia or China agreeing to limits on other types of things? And we haven't done that in a long time in the United States. We're not very good at it. The Congress is not very uh, deep in its understanding of why these things matter. And, you know, we have a lot of work to do to try to improve the dialogue on just those things, let alone, you know, whether the the president should be constrained from doing what he thinks is right or wrong. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Let me go uh, back to Tong. First, I, we can't avoid the fact that at the moment Russia is an adversary. Uh, I would hope that Washington is not locked into the mindset of treating China as an adversary. Uh, certainly a rival, perhaps a potential adversary. Uh, but I see more hope for a reasonable dialogue with China today than with Russia. And, and with that in mind, Tong, um, Mr. Sullivan's remarks about working within the P5 as well as working bilaterally with China uh, makes sense to me if I, as I mentioned, I think it'd be very hard to get to the level of arms control connection and vocabulary that we have with Moscow to get there quickly with Beijing, uh, but perhaps smaller measures on risk reduction, on crisis communication, on notifications back and forth, rules of the road in space. Uh, which of these have the potential to begin a U.S.-China uh, conversation on any level, and how can the U.S. best package these in order to draw Beijing's interest? Um, again, I you know, really appreciate uh, the U.S. the Biden administration's efforts to find uh, whatever way possible to engage China on nuclear weapon and arms control issues. A multilateral approach certainly has a greater chance of success. Um, but I think perhaps more importantly, uh, the U.S. needs to take a broader approach. Uh, China, like Russia, you know, uh, sees um, the problem on uh, strategic security issues, nuclear weapons, as a technical problem. Um, they think a much more important, much broader problem is the political problem of the bilateral relationship. Um, that's why, like Russia, China is basically holding uh, dialogues on nuclear weapons arms control hostage to a change in the bilateral political relationship. In other words, um, I think the current American approach uh, still focuses uh, a little bit too much on te technical level solutions only. And on technical level, there are two extreme ends, or two uh, you know, ends of the spectrum. On the one hand, you have 
proponents of under control measures, you know, who advocate you know, uh, very flex different types of under control models, bilateral, trilateral, multilateral, uh, different uh, contents of engagement, uh, arms control, you know, notification measures, uh, risk reduction measures, crisis communication. Um, but we see, you know, China's lack of interest to engage, uh, basically, even on you know most uh, low-hanging fruit measures of risk reduction. Um, I think we we need to understand the limits of that. You know, pursuing that measure alone. Um, because of lack of senior level political will, um, Chinese officials at the operational level, they would need to take a lot of effort, even personal level risk, to propose those uh, um, proposals. Um, but they are still hard to get blessing uh, from the senior leadership. So, so much is determined by influencing the thinking of the senior uh, Chinese leadership. On the, the other hand of the spectrum is you know, efforts focusing on building military countermeasures, uh, strengthening deterrence, et cetera, et cetera. It makes sense. I think you know, a credible deterrence makes war less likely to happen. But the risk is some of the measures can feed into the Chinese fear I just uh, discussed and, and further reinforce the Chinese paranoia that the U.S. goal is just to maintain military hegemonism. And that strengthens China's interest to invest more in its own military, including nuclear capability. So that alone also doesn't um, help. Um, I, I tend to um, uh, think uh, that we probably uh, need um, technical level measures as part of a broader whole of government or even whole of society approach in engaging uh, China. Um, it requires a much broader strategy in the U.S. and international community that would help address the underlying challenge in the relationship, which is the serious information asymmetry and the subsequent, um, uh, or consequently, the serious perception gap at the societal level between the two sides. That's the fundamental source of threat perception and interest in, in nuclear uh, investment. And we need to uh, engage, or the arms control nuclear policy community needs to engage with the Chinese counterparts as part of that whole of society effort. And, and here on nuclear, in the nuclear area, there are many things I think we can uh, work on. There are so many uh, misunderstandings about each other's policy and thinking and the interest. You know the, the, the on the you know most uh, dangerous issue of Taiwan. Um, you know the two sides genuinely disagree about who wants to initiate a military conflict. They also genuinely disagree about who wants to escalate a potential conflict to the nuclear level. And that's you know the concrete things I think the communities here can start uh, uh, talking about and reduce uh, the dangers. And, and lastly, I think. A key source of risk is, you know, the increasing secrecy um, and uh, closed door type of decision making in China. The military, the defense industry, they are given a longer leash to pursue uh, more assertive capabilities and postures. Well, whereas the traditional arms controllers, the experts who support arms control and cooperative security, their voices are more marginalized. Um, so it's a lack of internal accountability and checks and balances, I think, is, is a key problem. And I think the U.S. community can help mitigate that issue. You, you have congressional uh, organizations, you have NGOs, think tank communities, uh, civil society organizations. You can launch a broader engagement effort with China and use that to encourage, encourage internal Chinese nuclear policy debate. It's a lack of internal policy debate that is you know, uh, contributing to a not necessarily coherent Chinese nuclear policy. Um, and I think that's one way the U.S. can make um, an effort. <clears throat> Fascinating. Thank you. Um, Lynn, I'll give you a, a good open-ended question to talk about anything you'd like. And after that, we'll after Lynn's answer, we'll open the floor. So have your questions ready. 
Um, you've written in the article I mentioned in Arms Control today uh, that the U.S. has to recommit to efforts to constrain the nuclear arsenals of competitors, but this will require elements of continuity and new approaches. Uh, could you share with this audience what you mean by the new approaches? Sure. Um, well, some of it relates to your question um, about congressional sentiment, because um, I think we have to be open to other forms of agreement besides legally binding arms control treaties, although those are still desirable in many cases, and certainly, um, you know, I would like to see that continue, that that 50 year tradition of agreements with Russia continue, um, and probably ultimately we'll get there again with them. But um, there is also a space for um, other kinds of agreements, and, you know, be it you know, parallel political commitments, um, executive agreements, um, just some of the some of the new technologies and challenges that we're talking about are more prone to you know norms and rules of the roads. Things like um, understanding that it's not in each other's interest to to probe into nuclear command and control systems and, and that kind of thing, and maybe having an having an agreement on that, which can't be verified, but. Um, it can be important to, to raise understanding about, you know, while it, why, why it's uh, important to exercise restraint. I think there's other areas um, of, of, um, of restraint that can be very important, and, and one would be how we respond to concerns about China's uh, buildup. I mean, I, you know, I heard uh, Jake Sullivan say that you know, we will live within new start limits as long as Russia does through 2026. Um, and then a future, you know, if we can get into a negotiation with Russia about a future agreement, um, the numerical limits we can live with will be affected by um, China's force. I mean, John just reminded us that right now we have nearly 4,000 and Russia has over 4,000 nuclear warheads. China has 400. Um, so there, this is, there's a temporal element to this, um, which is that China's, you know, oh, you know, 10 or 15 years away from having what's, you know, currently the worst case projected um, amount of forces. And so um, it's not at all clear that we will ever need more than the 1550 we have now to deter China and Russia, and it seems to me a priority really needs to be keeping Russia constrained um, as we start to have a dialogue um, with China. And as um, Tang has pointed out, our actions, you know, will have some influence, uh, presumably, on on how China develops its, you know, forces and the, the threats that it sees in the world. So. Anyway, coming around, I think there's different forms of agreement. There's unilateral actions and self-restraint, and there's, you know, different technologies, as, as Jake talked about, that we're not concerned about that aren't conducive anyway to, you know, c counting and verifying and visually inspecting. And so we have to be open to new ways to address the, the threats that we see and how to mitig mitigate them. Thank you. <clears throat> um, let me ask if uh, you have jotted down a question on a pad, if you'll hold it up a little bit, our team will collect them and funnel them to me. I see at least three or four, so I hope we'll get them up here uh, rapidly. Um, thank you for that, Lynn. Um, there is indisputably a need for new mechanisms of negotiation and new forms of agreement. Uh, both with uh, the uh, People's Republic and with the Russian Federation. I'm going to buy you time to read your questions, Go Tom. Ahead. And I'm going to, I, I, what Tong pointed out was fascinating to me, and I, I read your stuff regularly, but it, you know, it, it helps to see you in person and pull these things out. It, um, this mismatch of approaches is not unusual, right? Uh, the United States wants to build up some understanding and make some momentum through technical talks and build the way up. And it sounds as if you're saying what China's really looking for is a broader landscape. And then if that is 
easier than you can, and it really gets to the point Jake was making, which is about compartmentalization or non-compartmentalization. And we're gonna need, if, I'll assume for a second, everybody in the room thinks it's better to talk than not to talk. We're gonna need to find some way to change that language, because it sounds like it's not really about compartmentalization as much as contextualization, right? If, if the United States and China can agree that we're better off in a non-adversarial relationship and have some top cover, then it seems like things are possible. But it's harder to get to a non-adversarial relationship unless we're talking. And, and it seems like that's where the conundrum is for me. I don't know whether, Lynn, you have the same view or did that buy enough, Tom? Yeah, uh, Tom and to it read? leads into one of the first questions. Uh, first, I absolutely agree that we've got to talk as governments. I think there's uh, a great need for both Americans and Chinese to, uh, I don't mean to say educate Congress, but to help Congress to tone down its own rhetoric. China has become just too easy a target. Uh, we have to be clear-eyed about where there is competition, where there is danger, uh, without exaggerating it. And on that, um, the first question I have here is, what can the administration do to reduce China's fear of an increasingly hostile and threatening United States. And uh, that's for all of you. <laughs> but. Well, I, I can start. Um, um, you know, I think clearly, like Russia, China thinks uh, we need a political level dialogue that somehow settle or define the overall bilateral relationship first. Um, but however, I don't think China knows how to do it. Um, instead, China is equally, if, it not, if not more disillusioned about the prospect of dialogue and you know, uh, persuasion uh, to change the nature of the bilateral relationship. And therefore, that disillusionment contributes to even greater power century mindset, thinking that you know, power buildup is, is the ultimate uh, if not only solution um, to change the U.S. and Western perception. Um, so perhaps the U.S. will have to bear the greater uh, responsibility to, to come up with initiatives. Um, what I think is lacking here uh, in this town is a serious research uh, into what a broader strategy to address um, again, the information asymmetry and the perception gap at the societal level that affects all aspects of the relationship, including nuclear relationship, uh, and how the nuclear policy community can, can work as part of that uh, broader uh, conversation. But I, I think there are specific issues uh, this administration can you know, uh, start uh, considering uh, in order to uh, show that uh, it is willing to uh, 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 listen to China uh, and engage with China in a way that is acceptable to China. And here, we, we uh, you know, it appears that China is uh, unwilling to discuss most of the issues related to nuclear weapons and arms control, except a very small number of um, uh, Chinese favorite topics like no first use. And perhaps it's time uh, for U.S. to um, you know, uh, do something to uh, uh, avoid an uh, increasingly uh, internal, internally hardened position uh, around building up uh, deterrent, but think of ways that U.S. can show a greater willingness to engage China on those uh, China-favored uh, topics no first use is, of course, not going to fly here. It's, it's too much uh, obstacle. But there may be ways to uh, you know, uh, readjust the topic. Um, for example, you know, uh, consider a, a Taiwan-specific U.S.-China bilat uh, bilateral no first use uh, agreement that wouldn't involve American allies, wouldn't undermine U.S. security commitment to other U.S. allies. Uh, that would help uh, uh, China clarify one of the most widely uh, 
concerns and loopholes in China's no first use policy, which is whether it applies to China's own territory, including Taiwan. It would make China less likely to threaten nuclear use directly or indirectly in a future conventional war over Taiwan if China can agree to an explicit Taiwan-specific uh, U.S.-China bilateral no first use agreement. So I think um, you know, making a gesture of wanting and willing to engage on issues like that without having to change American policy, I think that would you know, have some hope of starting uh, a nuclear discussion. Please. I want to give Lynn an opportunity to dive sure. in, but I've got, yeah. I mean, I, first of all, it's, I mean, obviously China, United, Russia and China are such different countries. Our nuclear relationship with each of them is extremely different and how we engage them needs to be really different. And whereas I think in the, in the case of Russia, um, compartmentalization is what has worked for many years and probably you know, will, should and will again work. And in other words, the ability to talk about and manage nuclear weapons and risks, even despite lots of other tensions and problems in the relationship. It's clear with China that at least for the foreseeable future, it's exactly the opposite. And I do worry a lot about the environment we have now, which, um, you know, and I think the administ this administration has leaned very heavily into the, you know, China as the pacing military, you know, competitor. All, all the DOD strategy documents are focused on China. Um, we s seem to be trying to um, decouple somewhat economically from China, which again is so different from Russia. I mean, you know, our, China's economy is going to be a significant part of the world economy, and I don't think it's possible to actually, you know, you can reduce some dependencies, but there's going to be a lot of interdependence, and that's probably a positive thing for um, stability and, and, and reduction of conflict. And so, um, I, it's clear that the, that the broader, the Chinese have made clear that the broader relationship has to have more elements of, you know, cooperation as well as competition. And that broader, you know, for the broader parameters have to be kind of set before we're going to be able to get into the kind of nuclear dialogue that we hope to have. And so I don't know when that happens. Maybe it doesn't happen until after the next presidential cycle, if at all. But it seems to me the entire, uh, the mood of the entire country is, you know, focused very much on the adversarial piece and maybe insufficiently on the where are the opportunities and necessity for cooperation to manage, um, you know, conflict and, and China's, you know, rise in Asia Pacific, which is unavoidable. I'll, I'll try to be brief here. If, if I was in government and I was asked, you know, how can you think about trying to find a better context and, and work on something that might give them room. I'm not arguing we should do this easily, but one of the things we've never done is say to China, we are in a mutually deterred relationship, right? Mutual assured deterrence works. You have 400 nuclear weapons. They can destroy major U.S. nuclear cities. They can hold uh, U.S. allies at risk. That is something we know you have. You know we have an even greater capability. So let's figure out how to manage that deterrent relationship you would run into a number of challenges immediately. How do you work with your allies? Are they going to be comfortable if we say, yes, we're mutually deterred at the nuclear level? Are we doing enough at the conventional level to make sure that China doesn't view that statement as somehow advantageous or giving them? So, I mean, I'm not saying that's easy by any means, but one thing we do hear and have heard for many years is China saying, you've never even said those simple things. Um, the, the U.S. view generally tends to be, if we say it, China will pocket it and our allies will get nervous and we get nothing for it. And one advantage of President Biden is that he generally is willing to say, yeah, 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 I've heard that for 40 years, I get it, we're going to do this anyway. And so I think there is some value in trying to work through that. I don't know whether that's enough. I mean, quite frankly, I don't think anybody knows what will be enough to get the Chinese prepared to engage in a conversation. We've tried direct, we've tried P5, we've tried broader, we've tried UN. It, it, you know, it, it's increasingly frustrating, but apparently, you know, our, our job is to keep trying, yep. especially when we're simply acknowledging what many people consider to be reality. And which we have acknowledged vis-a-vis -vis 
Russia. Right. <clears throat> um, let me change the subject a little bit. Um, there's an argument by Matthew Koenig and others that a trilateral arms race is unlikely because historically, since the Cold War, the U.S., Russia, and China have all made their nuclear decisions uh, driven internally by political and technical developments and not so much in response to each other's arsenals and strategies. Does that make sense to you or Lynn? Yeah. First of all, I mean, that seems completely untrue in the U.S. Oh. Soviet, U.S. Russia yeah, but nuclear especially, relationship. Uh, particularly <laughs> since the Cold War, to be fair to his argument. So. Oh. so he's saying since the Cold War. Well, I mean, I just. Okay. Good, good. I you don't agree. Anyway. Any, but any <laughs> I other don't comments? I, 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 don't, I don't agree, and I'll tell you why. Even if you think that nuclear weapons decision making on numbers and investment is driven by internal factors, politics are part of that internal factor. Russia and the Soviet Union have wanted to be seen as nuclear peers of the United States. Um, even in good times and bad times, they've wanted to maintain some what we call near relative parity, right? So. The United States has been unwilling to be second, or has wanted to be second to none, and already you see the pressures where the United States will feel it has to, in order to deter, which we can do at a much lower level, um, but in order to reassure or to do damage limitation, we will need to increasingly factor China as well as Russia into it. So we're, if Russia and China keep building up as they're going, or we will need to build up. Russia will then need to build up. China will then feel that they're vulnerable, so they'll need to build up. And that cycle is what we saw before. We saw it in a bilateral sense, and that's why everybody refers to the three-body problem without having read the book, <laughs> which talks about the instability and the inability to predict how three celestial bodies operate each other in a gravitational realm. We are all in a gravitational well with each other, and increasingly we're going to affect each other's trajectory, and it's going to be unpredictable. And oh, by the way, let's sprinkle 10,000 nuclear weapons. That doesn't strike me as being a pretty, pretty okay. good, good situation. Let me go to <clears throat> a little bit about what Ukraine has revealed. Um, it has shown the weakness of Russia's conventional forces, and arguably has increased Russia's dependence on nuclear weapons, particularly non-strategic nuclear weapons. Um, does this make it even harder for Moscow to agree to the kind of changes that would address U.S. concerns and the goals that Mr. Sullivan laid out? And what would the U.S. offer in return? And let me combine that with a similar question about Ukraine, which is, do we know that China has actively discouraged President Putin from use of tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine? And if so, how strongly has he said that? Two thinly connected questions, but I'll turn to either of any of you to uh, give an answer. Tom, do you have a view on the second one? Um, again, there's so much, uh, so less, uh, so little uh, publicly available information, and, and my, my personal speculation for what it was, uh, for what it uh, is worse, is um, the Chinese leadership perhaps, you know, voiced concern about nuclear escalation uh, with um, his Russian counterpart. Uh, I just don't see Chinese senior leadership um, feeling comfortable putting direct and blunt pressure on Putin um, in, in a coercive way to, to change his thinking. And, and, and that partly is because China, in the first place, doesn't share the Western concern that Russia is serious about nuclear use. Right? China is largely and genuinely sympathetic that Russia is just making the most out of its small capability to deter, uh, you know, an aggressive uh, NATO uh, efforts to weaken Russia as a country. So Russia wants to make use of nuclear coercive leverage, and that's, you know, to some extent, understandable. And, and doesn't mean Russia is serious about uh, 
uh, initiating a nuclear war. Okay. Yeah. Please, John. On, on Ukraine. So, look, it, nobody knows how the war is going to end, and nobody knows whether Vladimir Putin is going to feel like he should just cut his losses or will continue to double down. Um, I think there's probably pretty broad consensus in the non-proliferation arms control community that the best way to show Vladimir Putin that his nuclear weapons aren't that useful is for him to lose in Ukraine. Okay. Right? If you show that nuclear blackmail is not successful, it's not only important in terms of future Russia, but also in terms of China, North Korea, and elsewhere. So I, you know, my sense is there's fairly broad support. There are different levels of concern about Putin's willingness to escalate and actually go nuclear or not. Um, but there is no question that with a decimated conventional military, it's going to be much harder to negotiate a deal on his substrategic nuclear weapons or non-strategic nuclear weapons without the United States thinking through whether we're in a better situation in this asymmetric arms control world. Are there things we're prepared to not do in terms of hyperglide or prompt strike or forward deployed capabilities if Russia agrees to reduce its stockpiles of non-strategic nuclear weapons? The, I, I totally understand if I were in government, I would be you know, on board with, you know, we should be supporting every NATO ally, showing our commitment, investing, deploying, doing what we need to do to make sure that deterrence by denial is credible. But once the war is over, thinking through what the future of Europe looks like and how we pull back, the idea that we need to have that defense posture, which was geared towards the pre-February Russian military, which turned out to be a shadow of what we thought anyway, and has now lost perhaps 20,000 pieces of equipment, right? And however many hundreds of thousands, right? It's just nonsensical. We need to do that calculation anew, but we're not there yet. And I think the, the capability inside the US government, and quite frankly, in our community to do that is also atrophied over many decades. <clears throat> Thanks. Let me give a, a final word to Lynn on this topic or anything else you'd like to say? Sure. Well, first of all, I mean, the risk of nuclear use in this conflict is not negligible. It's, I don't know how high it is, but it's, it's still present and we should be concerned about that. Um, I think we already know that great damage is done just by the nuclear coercion and the, you know, attacking a non-nuclear weapons state, um, you know, with some, some degree of impunity because, partly because Putin has nuclear weapons. You know, at the same time, at the strategic level, I think deterrence has, has worked mutually in that there's reasons why Putin hasn't, for instance, attacked NATO supply lines. And just as, you know, the United States and NATO have been cautious in how they're appropriately cautious, I'd say, and how they have been supporting Ukraine to avoid escalation with Russia. But, you know, we just have to hope that that maintains. Um, so I don't know. I think how the war ends matters because at the end of the day, how, you, you know, you know, were nuclear weapons were a factor as a coercive tool, but, you know, did they have any, you know, they really don't have military utility. And I think if, God forbid, he used um, a nuclear weapon, there might be an, an immediate tactical <laughs> win, but I think the strategic loss and consequences would be immeasurable. And so I think the, you know, the verdict is out. And we'll, we'll just see the, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, as we were reminded at the beginning of Jake's speech today, it led to a very period, a fruitful period of arms control and um, constraints on reduction of nuclear threats. And maybe at the end of this war, there'll be some opportunity to reconstruct a security architecture that begins to bound these threats again. Yes, we say in the Middle the East, <laughs> from your lips to God's ears. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions. I will hand this back to Daryl, who will explain to us how to eat lunch. Uh, the, uh, 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 but join me in thanking our panelists today.